Thank you, Michaela. Pleasure to be here. And uh, I know everyone's coming back from lunch, and the glucose and the insulin is starting to rise. So I'll try to uh, not put everyone to sleep. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to talk today a bit about what is Kubernetes from the perspective of multi-cloud and assurance in a multi-cloud environment. Uh, as Michaela mentioned, I'm co-chair of the policy work group uh, under uh, the CNCF Kubernetes uh, uh, open source project. Uh, we are focused on declaring how Kubernetes policy should be expressed, how vendors or implementers of Kubernetes might support tooling for that policy expression, and then generally looking at compliance and how policy and compliance can work together for Kubernetes. Um, and in addition, my background, I've done a lot of PIPs crypto, PKI crypto, a lot of uh, both as a product and operator of those systems. So I've been both the, uh, the victim of this technology and beneficiary of the technology. Uh, so Kubernetes, and I'm, I'm going to skip over the tutorial about what Kubernetes is. There's a lot of great material out on the web. Uh, but for those of you who aren't familiar at all, I'll just summarize it by saying it's an orchestration engine for containerized workloads. And in the context of multi-cloud, it really touches a lot of the applications that we're relying on today. And it's becoming more and more foundational to the general infrastructure, including how we deploy applications, how we secure applications. And it, it's hosted on multiple clouds. And it touches more and more the data that we rely on for analytics, for business applications, or mis mission applications. So it really is becoming uh, a central point in any modern cloud native stack. And so it's foundational to how you operate, how you secure, and how you remain compliant. Uh, it has experienced a tremendous amount of growth, uh, specifically in multi-cloud use cases. Uh, this is some uh, synopsis from a VMware uh, survey recently. And I think the message to take away here is that uh, if your organization isn't using Kubernetes in a multi-cloud environment today, it soon will be. Uh, the use cases driving that adoption, uh, there are a few. So the data tends to drive a lot of cloud native application. Where is my data? And any of us who have gone through an attempt to do a data warehouse, a data lake, a centralization of that data, uh, quickly find out that by the time you have built that fantastic uh, unified data plane, the developer is already moving past you. <laughs> so it's almost obsolete by the time you deliver it. Um, so the reality is the developers are going to go to where the data is. Another dimension, uh, probably more in the private sector, is that organizations are really uh, you know, kind of the uh, nesting dolls, right? They're organizations within organizations. There's mergers and acquisitions. There's spin-offs and spin-outs. And then new teams that, that form and reform. And each of them have a very uh, opinionated approach to how they're going to do application development or even operations at an IT or infrastructure level. And it's very difficult once a, a team uh, gels around a particular stack to get them to transfer their applications and infrastructure to a totally new technology or new stack. So you end up inheriting a lot of this multi-cloud, whether you like it or not. And then finally, the developers uh, drive the need. They're trying to deliver value uh, to the business or to the mission faster, and they're rewarded for that. They are increasingly asking for more self-service so that the platform is more service to the developer, not the other way around. Um, and they're trying to partition themselves away from the security and scalability and uh, audit uh, requirements and using this platform to insulate them from those concerns. Um, and I, I like to think of this as you know, no, uh, no plan for any kind of zero trust survives uh, uh, the first encounter with the enemy. And, and developers, in this sense, are the enemy. <laughs> so um, a typical multi-cloud use case that really, I, mean, I think, idealizes um, how things should work and represents some real world cases of how things uh, need to work is I might have a service on Amazon that a developer group is spinning up that needs to talk to some analytical data or some analytical APIs on Azure and that itself is pulling in data maybe from a machine learning stack run on Google Cloud. So those are very real uh, scenarios today especially in places like healthcare, uh, financial services and so you've got to have a strategy for how to uh, adopt and adapt to that. So one thing uh, the SIG security uh, work group in the Kubernetes uh, nonprofit 
CNCF, we spent a lot of time in 2022 and 23 looking at the security of Kubernetes. And that had not been done for a couple of years, so it was overdue for a refresh. And uh, some of the key findings that you know, underpin the security of this foundational part of any multi-cloud system uh, where there's a lot of confusion around how access control across you know, some of the concepts that were discussed earlier today, identity, across boundaries, even within the network policies that were mentioned earlier, there's no really unified conceptual uh, framework for expressing these and reasoning about these in Kubernetes today. Some of the developers might argue that was by design because they wanted to have a decoupling and an abstraction layer between all of these concerns, and that separation of concerns is very useful uh, when you're a very you know, small, focused core team of developers, um, but as, if you've ever built systems, when that, when that code now hands over to a much larger group of users and, and developers, everyone else has different ideas. And so what might have worked very elegantly in the beginning now starts to break apart as, as a larger group of uh, developers starts to contribute. Uh, another problem is just reasoning about some of the interconnections and the cascading effects when you try to apply policy, when you try to apply security properties to a Kubernetes cluster and across Kubernetes clusters. Um, and they really had some uh, concerns. So I should mention that the audit was performed by an outside uh, group, NCC, and they uh, spent about eight, eight person months on reviewing the Kubernetes code, the Kubernetes uh, APIs, and then actually developing proof of concept attacks for some of these findings. And again, one of their concerns is when you're talking about how Kubernetes uh, implements things, there's a lot of plugins and there's a lot of add-ons. And so it's not a, a, a single uh, uh, plane of control. It's really an aggregate of many different parts. And that, that makes it difficult to apply resource level or object level permissions and policies in a way that is consistent. Um, I, would, I would also, there were some fairly specific findings in that audit. There was a CVE 2022-3162, uh, which would allow unauthorized access to some of these resources inside the control plane. Um, in in a, this particular case, a custom resource, which is a way to, to add additional functionality in the cluster. Um, so it shows that while there were no major findings, no critical gaping holes, there's still a lot to do in that code base and a lot of that complexity around the plugins and the interconnections make it very difficult for a new developer uh, to come on board and be effective and write secure code. And it's very easy to misconfigure, uh, so it's not, it's not easy to say that Kubernetes is secure by default. In fact, it's very, very much the opposite, that it really takes a carefully guided plan to secure it and to configure it correctly. Uh, and if you don't do that, there are various corner cases where you can subvert the control plane and get escalated privileges. Um, and then the last part of the 2023 audit was that they looked back at the findings from the previous audit, which I think was published in 2020, and many of those findings have not been fixed yet. So again, as an open source product project being used by many vendor products and deployed in many enterprises and in government, uh, it's important to note that it's, it's a, you know, there's a legacy of some bugs that still have not been fixed. There are uh, new bugs that we found in this latest audit. Uh, and I'll highlight in, in this context that multi-cloud, multi-cluster were explicitly not in scope for either of those audits. So that'll bring me to how do we reason about multi-cloud and, and multi-cluster in Kubernetes? And the first thing is looking at the threat model. So for the a general a cluster, the, uh, the main brain of Kubernetes is an API server. Essentially, every piece of functionality and every workload that's going to be deployed has to interact with it, this API, which makes it very uh, easy to use as a developer, uh, but it's, it's more of a, com a control loop and how things actually get deployed to the various hardware or, or virtualized nodes. It's not, a, a, it's not a serialized process. It's by design a distributed declarative process where you eventually synchronize the, the actual state to the declared state, the desired state. Um, and that's handled by the master control components, the, the, the kube scheduler, the uh, kube uh, controller manager, and for the cloud-specific components, the cloud controller manager. So there's an abstraction layer between the core Kubernetes underpinnings and, say, an AWS or a Google implementation of the underlying virtual machines or uh, 
IAM uh, APIs and various security properties. Uh, and then you have the worker nodes where the API client, the kubelet, is, and uh, proxies are involved, and that's controlling the communication between the actual workloads and the underlying services like storage and secrets, et cetera, are, are orchestrated. So you can see that as a threat model goes, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of interconnects between these parts. No one, no one box is all that complicated when you look at it in isolation, but reasoning over the interconnects becomes quick, very, very complex very, very quickly. And this is just one example of uh, a trace through uh, a, serv a service being deployed into Kubernetes called Argo CD and all of the uh, complex uh, traces you have to do through the system. And so another concern that I mentioned about the general uh, multi-cloud, multi-cluster threat model is that all of the great work that has been done in not just Kubernetes core, but a lot of the constellation of supporting projects and, and tooling on top of that have been audited, but in many, if not most cases, uh, multi-cluster, multi-cloud were explicitly scoped out. So we, as a community, we have our head in the sand a bit, and, and that benefits uh, our adversaries. So I think there's a, a you know, real need to look at how we model our understanding of this very complex system across multi-cloud so that we really understand how things can go wrong. And one of the things that can go wrong, of course, is identifying where the trust boundary starts and ends, how do we root that trust, what, are there cross-cloud uh, capabilities that we can use seamlessly? Uh, for example, today, it's very difficult to articulate how you would have a cross-cloud hardware root of trust. So a lot of the configuration and certificate-based protections in Kubernetes uh, are, are grounded in a you know, certificate chain that necessarily has to be propagated across clouds in some way, and there's no easy button to do that. And then as you start to try to unify things and build abstractions that can be uh, applied seamlessly, you now open yourselves up to failures that can spill over across uh, the clouds and the clusters. So things like incident response or a disaster recovery scenario, uh, you, you, you want the unification for convenience, but you don't want that to then create uh, a, a weakened posture in terms of bulkheads you might have against spillover. Uh, and then Kubernetes at its heart is really expecting kind of a flat, uh, fully addressable network. And so when you start to think about how does that work across clouds and across uh, you know, different IP uh, spaces, uh, it really doesn't. And then you have to introduce additional components and additional interconnects and gateways um, and, and systems that sit atop the software-defined network to make that cross-cloud communication work. And then, of course, you have to secure that. That goes back to the trust and the, and the root of trust. So again, it becomes very difficult very quickly. And you have in the cluster itself, but certainly more so across clusters and across clouds, you have no real universal uh, plane for getting telemetry and you know, detailed up and down uh, the stack observability of what's going on, and logs and audit becomes very difficult. Uh, so in addition to all the moving software parts, there are a lot of human actors in this process. So you have someone who's the expert on how to provision that infrastructure and configure that platform. You'll have the individual you know, hypervisor, VM, or physical server administrators. You have the Kubernetes subject matter experts who have read all the documentation, maybe attended conferences like this, understand how to reason about those boxes and arrows. Uh, but then you have your traditional SecOps or security or SRE teams. They are now having to fold in their existing tool set and apply that to Kubernetes, which might be brand new to them. And then again, that, that underlying uh, uh, group of developers who are really pushing the boundaries as fast as they can. Um, and of course, you may have some external users, you may have auditors, uh, so others who are going to be in the cluster, and you want to have eyes on those users at all times if you're going to have high assurance. Uh, and so what are the attack targets for anyone inside or outside? Um, you're really trying to find a way to move laterally across clouds. You're trying to open other resources on, in the organization or on the organization's cloud that you can pivot to. And I think someone mentioned uh, earlier today the, the, the Guam uh, attack, and that was a, a case where a very sophisticated actor was very patient and very deliberate and was able to pivot across different services. And so, you know, an attacker can have a very uh, 
diffuse set of targets and use the Kubernetes environment and this multi-cloud capability as a way to sit undetected for a long period of time. Uh, now, Kubernetes does come to your aid in some ways, and there are defenses for some of these attacks. So they do have uh, role-based and attribute-based access control. I think some have talked about this already, and others will be talking later. Uh, likewise, network policies that you can connect to the workloads in very granular and very thoughtful code-based ways. Uh, again, that PKI certificate-based authentication and you know, native support for encryption of data and secrets in, in those abstractions and those APIs. Uh, it has a concept of isolating workloads in namespaces, which give you some uh, measure of uh, guarantee of isolation across workloads. Not perfect. Uh, some of the audit findings from the last two audits address those. Uh, and it does have a model of, of having boundary control points, if you will, uh, these ingress gateways. So you can really meet some of those controls we all know and love around protecting what comes in and out of the cluster. Uh, I'll note that once it gets in the cluster, that tends, to, as I say, become a flat network and not very well isolated except in using those network policies. Uh, it's, it's, you've heard, I think, many times that the workloads are ephemeral, but in some way they are immutable because they're declared up front as container images, they're managed in a container repository, and you know at all times what workloads are being deployed into your cluster or across your clusters. Now, the, the instance of that particular image might be short-lived, so any one particular snippet of code running at runtime may come and go very quickly and not match up to your security and ob observability tools. So that becomes a challenge. But at least you know there's you know, a single source of truth for what is deployed in your cluster um, at any given time. I will note that the promise of Kubernetes for some is that your applications now become portable. Um, but I'll talk about this later, except when they're not. <laughs> and in theory, everything being API driven, being declarative, sitting in a data store uh, that the, the system orchestrates, everything should be observable, unless it's not. We'll talk about, about that later. And um, as Michaela mentioned a couple days ago, we talked about how you can use things like OSCAL to make all of this policy traceable back to compliance. And so having that API, having that code-driven uh, infrastructure really makes that possible. From a uh, policy perspective, I think others have talked about this, so I'll go quickly through this. But you can pretty much put policy around all these different resources in Kubernetes using kind of this plug-in approach. Um, so that really helps you control across different clouds in a, in a code-driven way. What should my policy abstractions be and then at the very last mile, you might have a shim that connects it to a particular cloud's implementation of that. Um, the nice thing about policy is that it, in Kubernetes, it can be both distributed and centralized, kind of getting the best of both worlds. It's distributed in that you have a consistent set of policy enforcement points via uh, these web hooks that call out. And, and so that policy enforcement point can query everything that's going on in all of these different clusters across all the different clouds. And so all of your applications, your data stores, your, your transactional processing can all be managed with these policies. It's centralized in that the policy being code can be uh, connected to your Git repository, any repository really, can be packaged up into bundles almost similar to the containers themselves, and then pushed out uh, through the infrastructure into all those Kubernetes clusters. I'll give you an example next. And then log storage and the policy results can all be aggregated uh, much more easily. And um, to my earlier comment, they can be connected explicitly into OSCAL artifacts for, you say, a system assessment result. So an example of how you might push these policy across your clusters and across clouds, there's an example CNCF open source project called Open Cluster Manager. And there they've built a, a concept of kind of having your hub Kubernetes cluster and then managed clusters or even sets of clusters that the hub can push this policy across. So you can imagine that you know, the box on the left can push across multiple cloud boxes on the right. And you now have a, 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 a semblance of that unified, cohesive policy, uh, policy definition and policy enforcement. Um, and so just a quick look at the details of that on the left. You'll have a developer who's writing policy as code and saying very specific things, in this case, you know, I expect my containers to have a particular namespace label, a, partic a particular repo source for those images, 
and then I can push that to my policy enforcement engine, and I'll note that there are multiple options, both open source and commercial, and you know, Open Cluster Manager doesn't really care, so you can have one cluster, maybe a team is running on Azure and it's using Caverno, and maybe you have another cluster on a different cloud and that's running Open Policy Agent or Gatekeeper, not a problem. And uh, there's another little part of that diagram, Argo CD, which is kind of that, that declarative deployment mechanism that runs itself in Kubernetes, on Kubernetes, but can also deploy Kubernetes clusters, applications, and components. Um, so you really can't have centralized control if you layer on more parts and, and more complexity. Um, so again, just to sum up some of those challenges, uh, you've got different implementations of all of these different underlying cloud, IAM, network policy, how those are actually enforced at the last mile. Um, you don't have a, a unified uh, vision or abstraction of identity and entitlements. Um, and as others have talked, microservices tend to explode. They don't become easier to manage over time. They become more difficult. Um, and across cloud, you can have performance and latency issues, especially around uh, those who have worked with large data sets, machine learning uh, use cases. And while you can capture all those policy reports and those audit logs in a central place, there's not a, there's not a cohesive definition of how to use that audit or how to reason through those audit findings. It's, it's fairly manual to date. Uh, and one last, uh, you know, going back to some of the audit findings, a lot of bootstrap efforts to bringing up a cluster and things that are somewhat hard-coded or might be ephemeral and then uh, hardened, but during that critical uh, spin-up period, there are a lot of open uh, holes. And you know, some of the commercial cloud providers will solve these if you use a managed Kubernetes like uh, GKE or AKS, but if you're running your own, uh, you're responsible for making sure that that bootstrapping process is secure. Um, and just a, a quick word that where things aren't portable is when you start looking at hardware-specific things or cloud API-specific things that your developers need. One might be confidential computing. You might want to use a particular processor with a trusted execution environment uh, or rooted in a hardware security module. That might not be available or might be available in different ways. And so you have to have that cloud-specific domain expertise. Um, and the ob observability and the metrics available at all these different cloud API levels, whether it's CloudWatch and Amazon or other cloud uh, models, they may not uh, natively uh, aggregate. You might have to write a bunch of glue code to make all of that observable and traceable. Uh, I'll, I'll touch uh, a little bit on cloud security operations and Kubernetes. Again, I think the, the, the key problem here is that the existing tooling doesn't really match up with the declarative code-driven model. Uh, so n you, you won't find many of these abstractions in the existing tools and, and vendor uh, offerings if they're not cloud-native, Kubernetes-native. Um, and that makes incident response and recovery very difficult and challenging. Um, we, we talked about some of the SBOM features earlier, but you know, again, it's to an operations team, that's a lot of new material that they have to understand and reason about, and how does it apply to their environment. Um, I think, you know, again, using the threat model, and I think others on the panel talked about this, using threat model to drive your decision making is very helpful. Uh, as you saw, the attack trees, the, the threat model trees can become very complex, but going through that exercise is very fruitful in helping developers understand the system, but also those, those supporting teams, the platform and, and infrastructure teams, as well as those traditional security operations teams. Um, I would say that the last point is probably where I would focus the last bit of advice. There's no silver bullet solution that exists today. There are a lot of great vendors offering big parts of the solution, and maybe some are trying to accomplish everything, um, but really this is a practice, and you know, those may be familiar with the martial arts, the notion of doing katas and really having your teams work through these exercises uh, continually and to grow their own knowledge, but also to uh, facilitate the communication that's necessary between all those players. Um, so uh, I'll sum up, you know, everything should start with that threat model. If you want high assurance for Kubernetes, you should absolutely be using a policy as code uh, for all of your decision making in, inside the cluster and at runtime. And, you know, I think there's an opportunity, I'll, 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 and on a high note, there's an opportunity for the community and the vendors to really address, you know, the multi-cloud observability and audit and being able to respond and, and defend across clouds. And so I think uh, that's where I'm going to look for innovation in the next couple of years.
both in the CNCF community and in the vendor community. Uh, one, one last thing, some, some resources that are useful. We are going to be uh, refreshing the Kubernetes threat model. That's going to be an ongoing uh, open effort for any who want to participate. I put the schedule info there. Uh, the, the details of the Kubernetes 2023 audit are available. Uh, and some of the other projects that I mentioned. Uh, we'll be dropping a lot of example OSCAL policy as code in a project we call Sledgehammer. And uh, we're available on Slack if anybody wants to ask questions. Uh, there's a public sector and then uh, uh, our policy work group. And so that's it. If we have any time for questions, if not, I can answer them offline. OK, sure. More questions? Great. Thank you very much.